Hello and welcome to Health Day Now. I'm Mabel Jong. Drugs that have long been stigmatized and used for non-medicinal purposes, including ketamine, MDMA, and psilocybin, are now being hailed as potential game changers for treating various mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, and addiction. If the studies continue to show promise and approvals follow, what should patients expect? What is it like to take psilocybin in a medically supervised setting, and how does it work? To find out more, we spoke with longtime psychedelics researcher, Dr. Charles Grob from the UCLA School of Medicine, and award-nominated actor, Tony Head, a research participant in a Johns Hopkins clinical trial. Tony was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer over 10 years ago, and he shares how his experience with psilocybin helped him face his fears of dying. Tony, you participated in two sessions. One was a control session in which you took a tiny amount of psilocybin that was too low to produce effects. And then in the other session, you received a larger dose. Originally, I was diagnosed with uh, stage four uh, prostate cancer. So uh, that was that was a real surprise. I mean, it um, just came out of nowhere, basically. Um, and um, it was difficult to deal with at first. But then, you know, uh, I think a year went by after I had been diagnosed. And um, I was in my uh, my oncologist's office in, uh, at John Hopkins, and he had a brochure. And the brochure was about uh, this study this uh, the psilocybin study. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, you might want to check this out. Then one day I, I, I opened it up and I read it and I, I went to the website. I, I looked at some of the testimonials from people and I decided to try it. And um, it, it was very, it's a very intensive uh, vetting process to get into that program. It, it takes at least six weeks of questionnaires, interviews, they know everything about your life from the time that you can remember. Mm. Uh, and your interview, also there's a, uh, a medical workup to see if you're healthy enough to, to uh, you know, to, uh, to take the medicine. So it, it took at least six weeks before uh, uh, we got to the point where they decided that I could do it. Just to set the, the setting of it, it's, um, they, John Hopkins has like a small apartment uh, kind of made up with the couch and it's very comfy and very, uh, very comfortable. And there's a couch and, and you sit on the couch and they, um, they present you the psilocybin in, in the same um, vessel that Native Americans used uh, when they, when they took it, uh, the uh, mushrooms uh, centuries ago. And you take, I took it. And after about five to 10 minutes, I told them, uh, I think I need to be lying down. And they said I was lying down. I didn't realize I was lying down. I lost all sense of my arms and legs probably after about 10 minutes. I couldn't feel my arms and legs. Um, I just felt like I was um, just there. I was existing. I, I, I didn't have, and by the way, you're blindfolded. And uh, there's also, uh, you have headphones on. So there's no stimulus outside of that. Everything is pushed in. So uh, uh, after that, uh, within about 10 or 15 minutes, I saw some colors. I saw what appeared to be a large mass of colors come toward me, it kind of brushed over me. That was the only time I was really afraid. I, I didn't know what was happening. But after that, for the next uh, five to six hours, it was, it, it was the most incredible experience in my lifetime. Um, it, um, it literally took my breath away. And the reason was, you, I felt, now this is my experience, I felt like I was just in an infinite space. And I was, I, I, I felt like I didn't even have to breathe. I just felt like I was there. One of the things I was worried about when I, when I went in there is that if I took this drug, that uh, I would start talking about all these things, all my problems and all my secrets might come out or whatever. 
once I was in the uh, session, everything about this world really didn't make any difference. It didn't make any, um, it had no value to me. The only thing that had value was my existence in this place where I was. Mm -hmm. And at some point in that time, I felt like a higher power or something. I didn't see anything. I didn't see any, any type of image. I felt like something connected and touched me. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it did, I just started crying and I started, I said, it's so beautiful. I can't, I can't explain it. And, uh, and then from there, it was just, just being there and just experiencing the place that I was. Um, as it start, as the drugs started to wear off, then I started thinking about things of this world. I started thinking about my family and, and things like that. But um, no, it's, it's an experience that I can't recreate in my head what it was like, but I can remember it's nothing like I've ever felt before. And you had mentioned five to six hours. Is that how long that feeling stayed with yeah. you? Yeah, it, uh, I was in that what I would call the deep, uh, the deep uh, time of it was five to six, maybe seven hours. And then after that, it starts to wear off and you start to, at least my mind, because everybody, you know, everybody has a different experience, but my mind started to let other things in after about seven, six, seven hours. I started to be aware of of my life and things about my life, but not, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't aware of any of that during the, the deep part of the experience. Who was in the room with you? I have, uh, you have, at John Hopkins, you have two guides that, and they're, and I, let me just say they're my friends for life. Mm -hmm. uh, I went through this whole process from the very beginning, and I, I'm sure everybody who has their friends for life with these two people. And, but they are in the room with you mm -hmm. to hold your hand if you need to, or to uh, just be there, just to know that there's somebody there. Uh, and so those were the same two guys that shepherded me through the, the whole uh, process of qualifying for it. Tell me how this has had a lasting impact on your ability to deal with the anxiety um, and perhaps depression that you had? What it taught me is that, because when you have cancer, and in my case, I, had sta I have stage four cancer, uh, you think a lot about dying initially. You know, you think I'm gonna die. And, and as a matter of fact, the, uh, the doctors told me I had in 2011, beginning of 2012, they said probably I had three to five years, something like that, if I was lucky. Right. Uh, so you think about dying a lot, but what I, my, the biggest thing I uh, got out of this was that uh, it taught me how not to fear dying. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't fear death. I, the one thing I did, I don't want to suffer for years, you know, uh, like that, but I don't fear death at all. I think that, that wherever death is, or it leads to, it's going to be a, a good place. So when that time comes, we all have to face that. It's just, just a matter of when you face it, you know? So uh, what, what, rather than worry about the cancer, like most people, you know, and it's understandable, uh, I think it taught me how to live better and not worrying about dying. And you haven't had any since, yet mm. the effects were so long lasting, you're still reaping the benefits of that experience. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe uh, my personal uh, opinion is I think somehow this drug opens a door to put you in another place that you wouldn't normally be able to get to in your brain. And uh, it has that kind of effect on you. It's uh, at least it did. At least it did for me. It was a very positive effect. Tony's experience seems to be in line with the clinical trial results coming in worldwide. What is it about the hallucinogenic chemical found in certain mushrooms? And what does it do to the brain? Dr. Charles Grob is a professor of psychiatry at UCLA with decades of research experience in the field of hallucinogens. 
Well, we just spoke with a research participant, a cancer survivor, who said his two experiences with supervised psilocybin therapy were so profound that it felt like some extraordinary power had touched him during his psychedelic session. What is the drug doing to the brain's neurons? Well, you know, psilocybin, as do other psychedelics, uh, profoundly alter our, our state of consciousness. It's, the, it's an alteration in the, what's known as the default mode network, okay. where regions of the brain that normally are uh, very much in communication, mm -hmm. uh, basically, in, in a sense, uh, d d briefly disconnect and uh, create a, a greater sense of, 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 of calm, at less, less of an internal chatter, and perhaps more opportunity to... Uh, to perceive beyond what is normally within our field of awareness. Okay, so what exactly is magic about the mushrooms? And, and you mentioned that other hallucinogens might uh, have a similar impact. There are similarities between psilocybin and LSD. In fact, LSD was the more uh, widely used uh, research drug back in the, in the 60s. Uh, and uh, today it's psilocybin. Psilocybin has some advantages, including relatively shorter duration, uh, e easier navigating the internal space, more, more visionary, and less likelihood of evoking uh, 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 unpleasant states of anxiety or even paranoia. The research participant that we spoke with said the actual psychedelic trip that he was on, it, it took place several years ago, but it lasted about five to six hours and from that session, he doesn't need to have the therapy again to reap its lasting benefits. How is that possible just to have this experience maybe once or twice many years ago, but still feel the effects from it? There's much of, of the range of effects and their implications that we, we still do not know, but this is not an uncommon report that individuals can have a a profoundly positive, even corrective ex experience, and uh, feel that, and report subsequently that they see themselves in a very different manner, a more positive manner, have um, a, a greater facility in, in handling various facets of, of their lives, and um, uh, uh, all, all in all, are more report being more functional, and with many individuals. There, there is reportedly, at least, not, not a need for subsequent treatment. You've written extensively about the benefits of this drug for people in hospice to help them face death. Who else would you recommend using psilocybin? Well, going back to the 50s, when psychedelics were first utilized in a uh, therapeutic mode, uh, there have been indications that show great promise. One, as you mentioned, would be individuals in existential crisis facing the end of life. Another group that responded remarkably well were chronic alcoholics, individuals for whom there are no standard effective treatments, not back in the 50s and really not, not necessarily today. What investigators observe dating back to the 50s, and this was, has been replicated recently by uh, one of our colleagues, is that uh, individuals with one powerful experience of a psychedelic, it was more often LSD in the 50s and 60s, today is psilocybin, but with one powerful altered state, appeared to have um, lost their craving and, do, and are able to establish and maintain sobriety far into the follow-up phase. Mm -hmm. the, 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 these studies were replicated uh, you know, a number of times back in the 50s and 60s, and more recently, a, a, a study uh, developed at the University of New Mexico, but implemented at uh, NYU, uh, are reporting or beginning to report very, very positive data in regards to the de degree to which individuals with chronic alcohol problems are able to in entirely cease their uh, their, their, their consumption of alcohol. Should the drug be taken in a controlled setting accompanied yeah. by therapy? Yeah, I, I believe psychedelic compounds uh, 
have tremendous potential to be utilized in a treatment setting. So I'm very much a, a, a proponent of, of, of optimizing the, the set and setting, optimizing the conditions under which the, the drug is administered and uh, doing so with a specific uh, intent in mind to address a, a therapeutic need. Do you see insurance plans um, paying for these drugs in the future? A complicated question. I, you know, what one would hope. This is th this treatment is not the kind of treatment where you visit the doctor and he or she uh, writes a prescription or gives you a pill and tells you, "Well, take it this week sometime, and then report back to me what what it did." That's not the model that 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 it's used. It's a it it really optimal delivery of this treatment involves an extensive screening process, preparatory sessions, more than one, optimally a few, the, the many hour treatment session, and then the integrative psychotherapy in the days and weeks that follows. This is you know, very time consuming and uh, th there's gonna have to be an adjustment of, of, of fee rates. And one would hope that there will be at some point in time, a coming to terms with the insurance industry where they will be able to identify that the value attained by the patient and the degree to which the, the therapeutic uh, change is, uh, is facilitated will be a cost saver moving forward into the future. Thank you to both Dr. Charles Grob of UCLA Medical School and award-nominated actor Tony Head for their insights and time. I'm Abel Jong. Thanks for watching Health Day Now.